Well, I guess we'll just jump right in, guys. It's super encouraging to see all of you here, though. I gotta tell you, um, it, it is just really encouraging to be here with you. I, I, I see a bunch of all in, out in my mind for Christ disciples in front of me. And so I'm super impressed. Um, now, it's not to say that the people who aren't here aren't out of their mind for Christ. It's just, you know, there's people who can't physically get out of the driveway. And I mean, my wife was on her way and turned around in a truck. So, I mean, it's not, I don't, don't hear what I'm not saying. I guess I'm just saying, I'm impressed. I, I see y'all. I, I know a church plant in Littleton. I think I've mentioned it to some of you guys before. They're doing outside services today. They've been doing them all year long. They did it whenever it was negative eight. Um, every once in a while, the pastor will try to cancel service. He'll say, let's just skip it. And his congregation will come to him and say, no, we'll be there if you'll be there. And, uh, and so that kind of stuff is encouraging to see just the, the passion and love for your church family and just the desire to connect in the worship gathering. So anyway, my, my knees are wobbling with love. Man, <laughs> love you guys. So let's just jump in. Let me start with a word of prayer to get us in the mood. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, my God, you are a good, good God, and uh, we love you so much. We uh, thank you for getting us here safely today. We pray uh, for your hand of protection on us as we go to leave here, that you'll get us home safely. Uh, Lord, we pray, we just want to invite you to totally take the lead here. Uh, nobody has come here today to hear from me. We have all come to hear from you and to hear what your Holy Spirit has to say. We pray that you'll prepare our hearts to receive the message that you've ordained for this time, for this day, for this group. Lord, it's humbling to be able to just come into your presence at all. Your holiness inspires our worship, and we uh, we just long to know you better. So we're here, ready to indulge in the fellowship with our family and our relationship with you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to start with a little bit of music. The first song is Awesome God. The original version.
episode's over anyway. <laughs> so thank you. You guys take a seat for a minute. We are going to just run through a couple of quick matters of business. Um, just a couple of announcements first. So this Wednesday, we're having a community dinner. All are welcome. Just a, just a social fun uh, uh, potluck style dinner event. And so um, uh, you're welcome to come bring a friend, bring a guest. Um, uh, the party starts at 6. We'll be getting here at about 5 to start setting up. Um, so uh, we hope you come and bring somebody and just, uh, just a way to hang out and kind of... It's nice, I think, whenever we get to do some stuff together like that that's social. So we're not just passing each other on Sunday morning in the aisles. And it's not all business every time we see each other. Hey, how'd that go? Or, uh, you know, these kinds of things. Uh, but to just be together in friendship over over a meal. So um, the community dinners are good. They're, they're one of my favorite things we do. So hope you'll come for that if you can. And then also we have a Good Friday family dinner. Now this one is not potluck style. The church is going to provide the food. Uh, unless some of you can't help it because I already see you thinking. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but space is limited for this one, so you do need to RSVP for it. Um, there's a, a link you probably got in your email recently. You can uh, get on there and sign up, or I can help you sign up today before you leave. Um, but you do need to RSVP because this is uh, going to fill up. It's already halfway full. So that's April 2nd. That's Good Friday from 6 to 8 here at the church. Be a good time, and I hope you come. And... Uh, so do RSVP. And uh, that's enough business. Now I'd like to introduce my friends and our guests. They um, have done some missions work that's been very encouraging that I want to have them tell you a little bit about. So Noah, Sarah, whoever, come on up here. <laughs> I don't know who's, if you're introducing or what. Hello, I'm Noah. <laughs> Good to meet all y'all. Um, I'm 17, so I'll just start with the introduction. Um, so last February, not last February, last January, I went on a missions trip um, to, uh, oh, my bad, sorry, skipping a couple of things. Sorry, I heard like this was on the fly. So um, I grew up in church my whole life, pretty much from birth to now. Um, and we left church a couple of years ago and we moved to a different church um, by God's grace. And he, there was a, um, There was a uh, type of uh, thing that was introduced called Vision School that I've never heard about, which was just um, talking about missions work, an opportunity to go out into the nations, share to people I've known, like have never heard of God or Jesus or anything. All I've known is Islam, pretty much. Um, and at first, I really didn't want to do it because it was nine weeks long, just once a week. I'm like, I could be spending that chilling at home. I could be doing all this kind of stuff. I'm not ready sort of thing like I'm not ready to do this like but that's not what you should do like God calls you when you are ready sort of thing um, but during that vision school one of the things I did learn is that there's a thing in the Middle East called the 1040 window which is just a window in the 1040 or in the Middle East sorry <laughs> where there are nations that have never heard of the gospel all they've known is Islam they've never heard of Jesus dying on the cross, they've never heard of anything like that. They can go their whole lives without ever hearing of Jesus. And so there's just this cycle of people being born in Islam, dying in Islam, going to hell sort of thing. And that kind of like broke my heart because I never even thought about that. I was like, oh my God, they're going to hell. They've never heard of this. They don't even have a chance sort of thing. And so a year after I took vision school, I decided to go to the nations. I went to, I can't say the place because of security reasons, so I'm going to call it L Land. Um, it's in the Middle East, but I went there. Um, I left during Christmas. Um, it was about two weeks long. Um, and while we were there, we went to a Syrian refugee camp. Hopefully I can say that. But we went to, <laughs> we went to a Syrian refugee camp. And that place pretty much broke my heart in a lot of ways because those people are outcasted. They're, they have no jobs, they, have, they live in tents. Like, they, live on the, they sleep on the floor, they eat like whatever they can, they don't have like, jobs or anything like that. They're not even allowed to leave their 
designated area. And there's tons of racism towards them. It's all that kind of bad stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> but when we were in the Syrian refugee camps trying to tell them about the gospel and trying to get to know them, we were outside of one house and they invited us in. And that was the, we met a lady, I will call her Sister O, for security reasons again. Um, but we met her, um, and that was the first time I ever shared my testimony to anyone. Mm. And I shared it with her. And my testimony has a lot of um, lack of love, a lot of family fighting, a lot of depression, anxiety sort of thing. And I told her all of it, pretty much, in my broken Arabic. <laughs> Because, yeah, but the she told me one thing that really broke my heart, which was, "You're like a son to me. I love you," mm. which hit me directly in the heart, and I cried. Like, and I usually don't, so that was <laughs> that was an experience for sure. But I cried, and like that was like one thing that I definitely needed. But one thing she did say that was heartbreaking after that was even though she said that she loved me and that she was like, a, I was a son to her, she said, I know, like, I still love you, but I'm gonna continue to be a Muslim. You're just like, you're gonna be a Christian and that's not gonna change. And that really broke my heart. And I left that tent, like with a broken heart, I went to the restroom and I just prayed. I was like, God, it feels like no one will accept you no matter how much we try. It feels like that in America, it feels like that in the nation I'm in, it feels like that everywhere. And I just gave, like I poured my heart out to God in about like, while I was in the restroom, I left and we went to a different house and like within 20 minutes, God answered that prayer and the people we went, they accepted. Not just mm. the, the mother, but the child as well. Like two people. Wow. Like, and that's the most, that was the first time I ever saw anyone accept God. Because you see people accept God in America, and it's not the same. It's like, I accept God, and then they immediately go back into their ways. But, mm. yeah. And that really broke my heart. So, like, for my mission trip, that was an experience I would never regret. Although there were hardships while being there, and that's something I would never regret. Uh, but, the ways it has affected me, I've looked on life a lot differently. I have gained like, just like the lady that accepted God, I realized people in America will also accept God. Like, although they are hard-hearted and very stubborn, God will still work through them no matter how hard we try. Like, Jesus still died on the cross for them, and we still need to love people in America. And I continue to, I'm continuing to go on mission trips. I still plan on doing that. And that's something I encourage everyone that hears this, that they should go on a mission trip, just to experience it. Not to go full time, because that's really big commitment, but just to experience something like that and try and get that relationship with God. Did you guys have a language barrier? Was it, did, you, did they speak English? No, <laughs> they spoke Arabic yeah. for the most part. And that was the hardest part, <laughs> I'd say, because our Arabic was just basic readings and that was very difficult <laughs> but yeah um but the only one of the ways that i was able to go on a mission trip a mission trip was because of the because of vision school it taught me about missions it was a, a opportunity to go out not like a forced opportunity but an opportunity so yeah so I, I praise God for that. But if you guys are ever interested in it, we are doing it on, I will let you guys know if you guys are interested in it. <laughs> but yeah. Good job. Thank you so much. Impressive. Man, that gets me excited just hearing about it. That was good. Um, man, I, uh, um, well, we're going to create some opportunities for us to do some short-term missions as well. And we're also going to be uh, trying to lock arms with others who are going to do some short-term missions. So if we can um, participate in fundraisers or, or just to help send people, we want to do that. And then, of course, we want to create opportunities for our church family to be able to go as well. So you'll hear a lot more about 
this over the next few weeks and beyond um, as we continue to just try to build the opportunity for uh, us to do a vision school or to send people out who are doing their own vision schools. Pretty cool. Thank you for coming. That was good. I was impressed. <laughs> um, all right, now we're going to uh, worship the Lord through our giving. So we like to say here that you um, don't give to our church, but you'll give through our church because we're very generous with the giving that is done here. So we use the giving to support missionaries. We, uh, both uh, long-term and short-term international, we use the giving to support local North American church planning. In fact, a, a great deal goes to that every month. We use the giving to fund our various outreaches. Um, we uh, stay pretty active in the community, and so we, we fund those things. And we, of course, use the giving to uh, create opportunities for us here to grow as disciples. So you don't give to us. Nobody around here is getting rich. Uh, you give through us, and we use that to, to expand God's kingdom and make disciples with. So we don't want as much from you as we want for you. And the uh, give is a part of how we will worship the Lord and invest in his kingdom expansion. So I'm going to say a word of prayer, and I'll come around and, uh, with the plate. And while the plate's coming around, uh, we're going to continue into the music portion of the service and sing praises to our Lord. So first, let me start with a word of prayer. Um, my God, my dear Heavenly Father, you are uh, amazing. It's amazing how you've sustained this church financially over the last year, or even two. Um, you know, because of the partnerships of other more established ministries, and because of your just, I mean, it's absolute miracles. I look at the numbers, and I don't even know how it's possible, but nevertheless, we've not had to miss a rent check. <laughs> And uh, it just uh, boggles my mind how you've affirmed our family and provided and sustained us through some tough economic times. Uh, God, I just want to thank you for, for bringing us to this place, helping us to, uh, to, to preserve this, this space where we can worship and comfortably and warm and well lit, all because of your faithfulness. It's way beyond our capacity. I just want to thank you, Lord. It is just your provision alone inspires my worship. I pray over this opportunity to worship you through our giving, God. I pray that you'll give the leaders of this church uh, absolute clarity, just crystal clarity on how to best administrate uh, your funds. And I pray your hand of blessing on the gift giver. As the um, giver gives, Lord, I pray that you will um, bless them and convict them and grow them. And uh, Lord, we... Uh, Say these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, while uh, I come with the plate, um, also for our online group, you guys can worship the Lord through giving. Uh, Tabby, actually, if you could, I'll just give you one of these. Um, our online group, you guys can worship the Lord through giving by texting the word GIVE to 970-478-1300. So that's 970-478-1300. Text the word GIVE or go to graceofthelord.church backslash giving for a bunch of options there. Um, some ways that you can support the church financially without spending money include um, enrolling in our King Supers Community Rewards Program. You just connect your King Supers account to our Community Rewards Program and you get the same discounts, you get the same fuel perks, but then King Supers gives to us. And then of course there's Amazon Smile. So anytime you shop on Amazon, if you remember us, Amazon will give to our church. And if you want more information on how to do that, it's all in your bulletin. There's a giving page in your bulletin with instructions and website links and all that good stuff. Um, it's in here somewhere. Here it is. So this page tells you all about how to do those kinds of giving as well. I encourage you to flip through your bulletin because there's a lot more information in here than we can say in, on a Sunday morning. With that, let's move forward and continue to sing praises to our Lord. Our next song, Because He Lives.
say a word of prayer. Now, the person who I usually would have pray at this time is not here, so I wonder, Taylor, would you be willing to spontaneously pray for us? Sure. Thank you, Taylor. You guys can take a seat if you like. Thank you, Taylor. All right. Let's pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you for your goodness, uh, greatness, and your wisdom. Um, with all that's going on around us, um, you know, sometimes we, uh, we don't always get it. It doesn't always make sense to us, but we know that you never change, God. That you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Um, you're always good, you're always great, and you're always wise, no matter what's going on around us. And God, we trust that, and we can lean into that. Um, and we love you, and we know... Uh, just how much you love us and just continue to open our eyes and our hearts um, that we can really see the treasure that is found in you, God. Um, we just uh, continue to give us the, the strength and the power to um, do the things that we are called to do, 
um, continue to die to ourselves daily. Um, God, we just want to be in deep, intimate fellowship with you, Lord. We just want to know you more. Um, we just want to fall madly in love with you, God. And we just ask that that would flow out into our life, into the people around us, um, that we could gather your sheep and your kingdom could grow. Um, Lord, if if those around us could see uh, the, the glory and uh, just the magnificence that's found in you, God, and all those other things that they're uh, captured by would just fall away. Um, Lord, we just thank you that we get to know you. We thank you for this place where we can worship you. And we thank you for the people that you brought here today and that are watching online. Um, God, just continue to work in us and give us the things we need to glorify you in all that we do. We thank you. It's in your son, Jesus Christ. name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Taylor. If you guys could turn in your Bibles to John chapter 21. If you need a Bible, there's a Bible on every row. You can have that Bible. You can take it home with you if you need one, or if you know someone who needs one. But either way, whether it be electronically or in that book, turn to John 21. We have been traveling verse by verse through the Gospel of John. We've decided, um, well, the Lord really kind of led us to um, starting this church on the foundation of the Gospel of John. And so for over the last over two years, we've been traveling one verse at a time, starting chapter one, verse one, and moving our way forward. And we're about to conclude this epic sermon series. We're one week away from being all done. And we find ourselves in a very interesting place where John decides to conclude his letter because his whole letter from beginning to end is asserting the deity of Jesus Christ. It's a very evangelistic letter that is by design to talk to all people from all nations of all, over all time about who Jesus Christ is. And, and, and as he describes who Jesus is in this final story, this climax, this conclusion of the epic letter, it's about the restoration of Peter. There's a, the storyline, basically, Peter had denied that he knew Jesus Christ. And nevertheless, John finds it important as he describes who Jesus is as the kind of guy, the kind of God who would um, redeem Peter anyway, who would restore him to ministry, who would forgive him and lovingly and tenderly minister to him while he feels the aches of his own betrayal. So you might remember some of the story. If you weren't with me, let me review. On the night of Jesus' betrayal, he's with his apostles, right? His, his leadership team, his band of brothers. And they're having a meal together. They had traveled to Jerusalem for this major religious festival, a big holiday. Everybody's coming from all over. It's the Passover. And in doing so, um, they've knowingly put themselves at risk because Jesus has a warrant out for his arrest. He had, done, uh, he had made some powerful enemies over the course of his ministry because his message flew in the face of the religious systems of the day. And the religious leaders were... Um, were very upset with Jesus because um, his message would often make them look bad. But they had a lot of political and economic and social influence. And so um, they were plotting to kill him. And uh, so Jesus has prepared his team for his death and his resurrection. And on this particular night, um, the night what we call the Last Supper, the ball gets rolling. Um, Jesus says, hey, one of you guys is about to betray me to my death. And they all kind of freaked out. You might remember, you know, they all became aware of their own individual insecurities, realizing that some of them had a, a walk with the Lord that, you know, they weren't all in. Each one of them said things like, hey, would it be me? Am I the one? Am I going to be the one who betrays you? None of them could quite figure out if it was them or not. Not that they had necessarily any plans to, but they were feeling very insecure about their relationship with Christ. But none of them guessed that ultimately the big betrayal would come from Judas. Because Judas, had, his behavior and his lifestyle was the same as the rest of those who had really loved Jesus. And we saw that it's really easy to fake fellowship. And there's some behaviors that just, man, you can't see through it. But you can't fake love. You can't fake love, even though you can fake some of these religious behaviors. So they didn't know it was Judas. They didn't know it was going to be him. Judas uh, would not be the only one to betray Jesus that night. Peter told, Jesus, uh, Peter told Jesus, he says, if you go down, I'm going down with you. If they're going to kill you, they're going to kill me tonight. You know, we're going down together. I'll go down swinging. But Jesus knew better. Or at least on that night, it wasn't going to be the way Peter had described it was going to be. Uh, Jesus had a tendency to not take people at their word for it, 
but to take people by their actions. And so Jesus predicted that Peter would deny knowing him three times before the sun rose that very night, which is exactly what happened. We saw Peter uh, in one moment while his band of brothers were all there all together and the arrest is about to take place. The soldiers are coming to get Jesus and Peter, he's feeling bold. He's with his church family. We're stronger together. He takes his sword out and he takes a swing at one of the soldiers' heads and cuts his ear off. Jesus heals the guy, which basically saved Peter's life because that would have been a crime punishable by death for sure. Um, and, but so, so here in that moment, when, when he was all together, because we're stronger together, he was feeling bold enough to honor his, the commitment he made to Jesus. But later that same night, when Peter was alone and without the support of his spiritual family, he was so fearful that he couldn't even stand up for his faith in front of a little girl at the campfire. And he denied even knowing Jesus three times. Hey, are you one of those Christians? No, I, not me. Three times Peter denied being a Christ follower, a fact that was haunting Peter after the predicted resurrection had occurred. Because Peter was, would then become face-to-face -face with the power of God and the reality of his promises, and it reminded him of his shortcomings. Because after um, the weekend, Jesus did rise, and he revealed himself to Peter as well as the others, and there he was, and the promise came true, and here's the resurrected Christ. And so Peter just felt even worse about his betrayal. Like, man, just constantly reminded of like the holiness and marvelousness of God and his own failure. So as we unpack our text today, there's a matter of language that we need to recall from some of our other previous messages before we start. Some of you have heard me teach about the three Greek words for love. And if you haven't heard this, I'll remind you, and you'll probably hear me talk about it again, because this particular dialogue comes up a lot, right? So well, in the English language, we have kind of a lazy language in some ways, whereas that we have a lot of words that can be used multiple ways. So, for example, I'll say to you, I love my wife, and I'll say, I love my parents, and I'll say, I love pizza. But you don't think that I meant that I love pizza the same way I love my wife, or that I love my wife the same way I love my parents. You know that I'm talking about a different type of love there. Well, the Greeks did well to define love individually. So, for example, they had this word eros. Well, where we get our word erotic. It's basically the word that describes romantic love. Eros describes romantic love. Uh, and then they had the word phileo. Phileo. Um, you can think of the word Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. The Greek word phileo describes like family love. You would use that, you would use phileo to talk about, you know, I love my friends, I love my family. Um, and then there's agape love. Agape describes an unconditional love. And we know that eros or phileo, right, romantic or family love, these things are not unconditional. There are certain behaviors that somebody could do in one of those loves that would result in them being cut out from fellowship with us, right? You know, a brother or a lover could do something so egregious that we cut them out from our relationship. It happens all the time. And agape love is a cut of, it's an unconditional love. There's nothing you can do to get into it. It's just going to be given to you, and there's nothing you can do to break that love. It's unconditional. Agape love is often used to describe the love of God for us. Whenever the Bible talks about the way God loves us, it's using the word agape, this unconditional love. It's not the only way that the Bible uses the word agape. In John 3, 19, the verse says, this is the verdict, light has come into the world, but people loved, people agape loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. So this talks, this describes a group of people who unconditionally love their sin so much. Even though the light is staring them in the face, they reject it because they're unconditionally in love with their sin. They say, you know, I don't care what it is, this me and my sin, we're in it, we're in it for life. And, uh, and so you can probably think of a few examples. The most common ones going around Aurora usually have to do with sex or drugs or intoxication. There's people who would say, I know what God's word says. I know what's cutting me off from relationship with God. But this particular thing, I'm not getting rid of it. Unconditional love for sin. But as we come to understand agape love being the unconditional love that God loves us with, we come to learn something about God that's fundamental to our worship of him. God wants family. He doesn't want slaves. 
He's not looking for religious slaves mindlessly obeying religious routines and rituals. Christianity is not a bunch of do's, don'ts, rules, rituals, rights, wrongs, systems, and ceremonies. It is simply the life of God being lived out through us because he's literally living in us. And it, and it is that simple. But it also, uh, you know, we think about Christianity in terms of behavior. But the, 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 the truth is there's never got to be a time where we try really hard to be somebody we're not. As we submit to the life of God in us. He lives his life out through us, and then the behavioral change comes as a side effect of that. If the emphasis is behavioral change, well, we'll never make it. But if the emphasis is on a relationship with God, then as he lives his life out through us, he transforms us, radically transforms us into somebody who looks more like him. So behavioral modification is a side effect. It is not the focus. With this in mind, so this is an important pretext to what we're about to read. So we're going to jump into our text today, starting in John chapter 21, verse 15. If you could read along with me. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, Follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. All right, so let's review what we just read there, because a lot just took place. Um, remember the setting. So the disciples had Christ appear to them after the resurrection, and he, he commissioned them for um, ministry. He gave them the Holy Spirit. So the first ones to really just be totally indwelled for the rest of their life with the Holy Spirit. And then he commissioned them to ministry. And uh, uh, instead of going, these six, instead of going directly out to answer the calling of God on their life, they were fishing all night. Um, they had gone back to their old life, something that was more familiar. They were working hard, and they had caught nothing. And in the morning, they um, um, encounter Christ again. He reminds them of their mission. Um, we talked a lot about that last week. And now they're having breakfast, and um, just as they had finished breakfast, Jesus decides to publicly restore Peter to ministry. Now, I think that this element of them having food and fellowship in the restoration of Peter as a point worth noting, because it shows that this is not all business, that it's a very relational matter. They're hanging out first. And the first thing that they did was not get down to the business of what Peter did and what he needs to do, but it was them just hanging out and being together and enjoying fellowship over a meal together. So just like Jesus. Now, Peter would have gotten the Holy Spirit with the rest of the gang when Jesus came into that room and told them they were all sent. But it seemed that Peter was so insecure because of his failing that he was struggling to go. He just was having a hard time wrapping his head around how he would successfully accomplish the mission that God had set out for him because he um, failed. So Jesus asks Peter a question. He says, do you agape me? So he asks, do you love me unconditionally? Peter, very aware of his shortcomings, and this recent failure says, you know, I phileo you. 
meaning, you know, I love you like a brother. We know that's not an unconditional love. It's a deep love, but it's not unconditional, is it? Now, that would have hurt Jesus' feelings. No, I mean, it probably would hurt most people, but Jesus knew what was going on here. He already knew Peter's heart before Peter did, remember? Jesus called Peter out before he was going to betray him, when Peter was, oh, I'll do anything. And Jesus, I don't know if you really will. So this isn't surprising, Jesus. He's not taught, Peter has not just taught Jesus something that Jesus didn't already know. It seems more like instead, um, Jesus is teaching Peter something that Peter needs to know. So Peter, Jesus says to Peter, um, feed my lambs. And then this dialogue happens again a second time. Jesus says, do you agape me? Peter says, I phileo you. And uh, Jesus says, okay, attend to my sheep. So Peter was reminding, was being reminded of his calling to be a pastor. He was being a pastor of people. And Jesus used shepherding terms. Uh, Jesus already called Peter out once off the fishing boat and said, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. I'm going to make you a pastor of people. And now here Jesus is reminding him of that calling. He was telling Peter to do more than just feed the congregation information and sermons, but to also take care that the sheep be properly collected, attended to, regulated, and guided. And it appears that Peter perfectly comprehended our Lord's meaning, and he saw that it was a direction not only given to him, but it was to be passed down to the rest of the disciples and to all of their successors in Christian ministry. And so they have this exchange two times. Do you agape me? You know I phileo you. And then Jesus asks Peter a third time, but he says this time, Jesus says, do you phileo me? And so the two previous questions of agape love, Jesus asked Peter in the presence of the other disciples were not to accomplish, that wasn't enough to accomplish what Jesus wanted to do in the life of Peter. So he asks a third time, and this time changes up the word to phileo. And Peter understood the significance of the question being asked a third time because it was a plain reminder of his previous denial of Jesus three times. So a lot kind of happening there emotionally. And the third time Jesus, he changed up the question, asked Peter, do you really have a brotherly love for me? Do you really have a friendly devotion for me? You say you have phileo love. Do you really? Asking, are you even my friend? Now, Jesus wasn't going to settle for a quick, superficial answer because he has this way of just getting directly to the heart of the matter. And that can get pretty uncomfortable. Make you squirm a little bit. Like, Ooh, where do... Huh. And so Peter had to face his true feelings and his motives when Jesus confronted him. There was no getting around it. Jesus was direct. It was clear what kind of love Hi, Jesus loved Peter with. And Jesus was making clear to Peter what kind of love... Peter loved Jesus with. You see what I mean? Peter understood that Jesus knew him better than he knew himself. Peter clearly saw the kind of love Jesus loved Peter with. Jesus was drawing to the surface what kind of love Peter loved Jesus back with. Jesus asks each one of us, not for our obedience primarily, not even for our repentance, and you've heard me talk a lot about that, not for vows or commitments or conduct, but for our heart. He asks us for our love. Because once our full heart is completely given, all the rest of those other things will follow. And after their dialogue is over, Jesus has Peter follow him. He uses this phrase, follow me, a phrase he used a lot when he was calling people out into ministry, out of their old life. Um, but this time he, he meant it literally, follow me as we go for a walk. And he then describes to Peter that Peter will one day, in fact, die for his faith. That the commitment that Peter made will one day happen. A promise that Peter made on the night of Jesus' betrayal. It didn't happen that night, but it will eventually happen. Peter would have some growing to do first. And he's got a lot of work to do on earth before he goes, but he would honor his commitment. Peter would eventually write in 2 Peter 3.18 that we are to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So clearly, Peter understood something about spiritual growth and formation that we can all understand. We think in terms of grace as this thing that happens all at once in that moment of commitment, and in many ways that's true, but clearly Peter understands that we can grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. 
So I think we can all appreciate this element of growing in our spiritual formation, growing in our spiritual maturity, which is exactly what happens in the life of Peter. So that's what we read. What can we learn from our text today? The first point that I think is worth making is the observation that Jesus cared very little about Peter's commitment, but he cared very much about his love. It's clear that Peter failed in honoring his commitment. He said that he would do one thing, but he ultimately did another. And so we learned that a promise is only as good as the person making it. That people's commitments are not often what actually happen. And so we've learned that uh, we don't take a person's word for it about who they are. We watch over time to see who a person is because our lives and our words don't always match. Earlier in our sermon series, we spoke a great deal about integrity. And we said you know, a lot more than I'll have time to remind us about today, but suffice to say that we learned how important it is to have a life that matches our words. It's a sign of spiritual maturity to live a life of integrity. And when we say we're going to do one thing but not actually do it, we're lacking integrity. When we make a commitment, you can count on me for that, but we don't honor that commitment, we let people down and are acting selfishly. Clearly, living a life of integrity is important, but it's worth noting that Jesus was far more concerned about the love he receives from us. Because, because it's no wonder, you know, if we are truly in love with God, we will honor our commitments to him. If we have a lesser love for him or no love at all, then it's easy to make a com it's easy to break a commitment that we've made. If we make a commitment that's motivated by our love for God, we will show up and we will do it. If we make a commitment that's motivated by something less, like attention or our desires, you know, you'll hear people say one thing and do another. Well, I'll give them a little bit more credit than they may deserve because when I hear them say one thing, I hear them describe who they wish they were, who they want to be. Uh, the things they want to do. And so I can't help but to see a little potential in there more often than I'm let down by the fact that they didn't follow through. But nevertheless, um, whenever we are motivated by something less than pure, unconditional, agape love, we find ourselves not being properly motivated when the time comes to honor that commitment. And it's the same with any other relationship, isn't it? Right? If you're in love with your spouse, for example, you will act in a faithful way, and it's not going to be too much to ask. But if you're not in love with somebody, unfaithfulness is a lot easier. People often do not mean to do what they've committed to, but you can't love without making a commitment. Every time you fully love, you are fully committed. If God has your heart, he will have your faithfulness. Now, faithfulness is a funny word. See, in the, the Hebrew, the word for faith and faithfulness are the same word. Now, we in English have decided to separate the two. So for us, conceptually, there's a difference between believing something and living like it. There's a difference between having faith and living that faith out. So like if we read the book of James in the original language, there's the original audience would have been saying a lot of stuff along the way like, no duh. When he talks about live out your faith, faith without actions is dead, these kinds of things, they would have all heard that and be like, yeah, obviously. Because the Hebrew concept of faith and faithfulness were the same. You couldn't have faith without living like it. If you weren't living like it, you didn't have faith in the Hebrew vernacular. And, uh, and so James wasn't written for that original group and generation. It was written for us who have disconnected the lifestyle of living out our faith. We have been the ones to separate behavior from faith. Peter understood this, and he realized his vulnerability that he was loving God conditionally that he put conditions on his love for God, that there were certain things that he just wasn't going to do at that time for the Lord. The condition that he put on his experience with God was, or his relationship with God was his experiences. He would demonstrate his faithfulness up to a point and then no more. There were certain things that were just not going to happen. So we know that Peter will outgrow this immature position, which is very encouraging for a guy like me because Man, we've got some growing to do. We see Peter grows in love and grace to become the man that's spiritually mature enough to live out his faith unconditionally. But on this day, Peter is not willing to give God his whole heart. And he says it directly. You know I phileo you. To love 
is to be vulnerable. And Peter's heart is broken by his own unfaithfulness. He knows the kind of love Jesus loved him with, enough to die for him. And he knows the kind of love he's loving Jesus back with, and he knows he's unfaithful, and it hurts him. He's feeling ashamed of that. He wonders if he's qualified to be the bride of Christ, or especially to be Christ's pastor, as he was called to be, because of his unfaithful heart. And if we love anything, we may certainly have our heart wrung and possibly broken. It's part of the risk. To be certain our heart's going to stay intact, we've got to give it to no one and instead wrap it carefully with distractions like hobbies, luxuries, or religious routines. With a heart hidden away, we won't have to be all in or sacrificially given to anyone but ourselves, nor will we have to take any risks of ever being hurt. But the most lawless and inordinate loves are less contrary to God's will than a self-motivated and self-protected lovelessness. If phileo was all Jesus was going to get, he was going to take it. Because love is where Jesus wants to establish himself with us, not in religion. He came to abolish the religious systems of the day and establish a relationship built on love. Christ didn't teach and suffer so that we could become more careful in our own happiness. We will draw nearer to God, not by avoiding the suffering inherent in love, but by accepting them and offering these loves to him. If our hearts need to be broken, and if God chooses a certain way in which our hearts should break, then so be it, because we know it is for our best interest, as Jesus is breaking Peter's heart here around the campfire. Which brings me to my second point that we can all learn from our text today. Jesus restores Peter. Peter's completely restored. He's completely redeemed, completely forgiven. After Peter's outright denial of Jesus during his crucifixion and resurrection, Peter's gone back to where he felt most comfortable, his old life of fishing. He's skipping out on the calling. He can't imagine it. He's fishing because even empowered by the Holy Spirit, after encountering the resurrected Christ and clearly commissioned into ministry, he couldn't think of anything else to do but to go back to the way things were. He had done the unthinkable. He had betrayed and denied his friend and his master, despite his bold claims of faithfulness. Peter had displayed the weakness inside him, which whenever he was pressed and whenever he wasn't hanging on to much hope. They say that Christians are like tea bags, dip us in hot water to find out what's really inside us. Peter had figured himself to be a great leader, a man of courage and conviction, but now he knew the truth. He felt like he was just a fisherman. That's the truth. That's true, at least apart from his relationship with Christ. But then comes a wonderful scene of restoration. Jesus makes breakfast for his friends and asks Peter one question three times, two different ways. Do you love me? When Peter was asked if he agape loved Jesus with a Christ-like love, Peter thought that, you know, gone was the man who was willing time and time again to step up to the plate. So each time Peter said that he loved Jesus with a lesser love for friends and family, recognizing the sad truth of himself, that despite his own efforts, he had failed at his promise and he could only figure himself likely to continue to fail. And you know what? He was probably right. But no more empty promises this time. This is part of the restoration. Because now Jesus had helped Peter purge from himself a false sense of security and a false confidence. And he boiled Peter down to appreciate the man that he truly was. Peter had his pride stripped from him and his humility was showing. Jesus wasn't shaming Peter. He was restoring him by showing Peter the truth that Jesus had known this whole time. Jesus knew who Peter was. He knew he was going to fail, and he commissioned him anyway. Jesus knew who Peter was, but Peter was just now starting to figure it out. We see that Jesus knew he would find out who a person is, again, not by asking them. Because if you would ask Peter who he was, he would describe a different man than who Jesus knew. He was. If Jesus would have taken Peter's word for it, Jesus would have been let down by Peter too. But Jesus instead watched Peter's life over time, pointing out the lack of integrity as often as it was displayed. Didn't beat around the bush until Peter figured out what God knew all along. And we noticed that while God knew this about Peter, the agape love for Peter persisted, regardless of Peter's 
failure and God seeing it coming, or even afterwards when the betrayal had taken place, agape love persisted because it is unconditional. And the behavior of Peter had nothing to do with the love of God. So Jesus doesn't berate Peter. He doesn't bring up his failures. He instead reminds him of the calling to be a pastor. Jesus reminded Peter in this moment of great honesty and transparency and vulnerability that all was not lost, but instead Peter was actually just getting started, that now finally he was ready because he was humble. That this new heart Peter had for who he was, was who he was without Christ was essential if Peter was going to accomplish the ministry set out for him by his Lord. He had lost his courage. He'd lost his reputation. The marks that he thought made him who he was. So now Jesus could finally remind him of who he really was. Peter couldn't see it at the moment, but that agape and phileo dialogue was all part of the restoration. Opposition, overwhelming circumstances, and suffering remove the things that we might be tempted to count on. We find ourselves stripped of those things that we thought made up who we are, and we feel naked. And only then can Jesus step in to remind us that no matter what else happens, we're his followers, and he's going to be with us to the end. That's his promise, that we are his disciples. We are his brothers and sisters. Jesus accepted Peter's lesser love offered in humility because Jesus could build on that. Before, Jesus only had Peter's prideful heart to work with, and that just would not do. Over time, Jesus would grow Peter in love and grace to eventually fulfill his commitment to die. History tells us that Peter would eventually be crucified himself, but Peter insisted he'd be upside down because he felt unworthy to die the same way that Jesus did. Despite what Peter's future held, Jesus told Peter to follow him. So in conclusion... I believe that this text asks us some questions about our walk with Christ. Are you making any commitments to God that you find yourself not keeping? Have you offered God your whole heart or just some of it? Are there any conditions that you've placed on your relationship with God? God, I'll call you when I need you, but whenever I go into this area of sin, I'm asking that you leave me alone. It's one thing to say we love Jesus, but the real test comes in our willingness to serve him inside and outside his church family. Peter had repented, and Jesus asked for his whole heart and therefore a commitment of his entire life. Peter's life changed when he realized who Jesus really is and who Peter is in Christ. Peter was given a new identity as he was transformed from a fisherman to an evangelist. And accepting who he was in Christ, compared to who he was without Christ, his relationship with Christ changed. Peter was forgiven, restored, redeemed, and sent out into ministry when he finally understood and accepted the words Jesus had been trying to tell him all along. Then Peter asked about how John would die, because he was comparing his life and ministry to another. Jesus told him we shouldn't compare our lives and our ministries to others because that comparison isn't how we are to rationalize our own devotion to Christ. Jesus said, what is it to you that I do with John? You're just expected to what? To follow me. He says, you forget about them. You just follow me. Man, that makes it simple. Everything that we just learned about Peter can be directly applied to our own life. If God could use Peter in this way and then send him out to be a pastor, then certainly he could use us for something else. Right? Mm -hmm. No matter what, unconditional love like that. I mean, it just inspires my absolute worship. So I want to take a moment to respond to the word, to give us an opportunity to apply the word to our life. Because I believe that a good Bible study is not measured by how much we just learned, but by how much we're going to let it change us. How will we be changed by the word today? The Pharisees knew the word of God very well. So the measure of an effective Bible study is not by what we learn, but how much we're going to change. So there's a couple of ways we could respond to God's word today. One, remembering that a promise is only as good as the person who's making it. So is there a commitment or is there a heart of love? 
Whenever I have given my whole heart, I will be fully committed. And so maybe we, as we're hearing this message, are reflecting on a place where we're lacking integrity in our life. We're saying out loud, hey, I'm an all-in Christian disciple. But there's a place where I'm not fully surrendered to God. There's a place where I'm not all in. And another way we might be able to respond to God's word is to just appreciate restoration. And just kind of looking at Peter's example. And remember my own testimony. Just a regular occurrence of constantly failing. And seeing God redeem and restore and build and send anyway. Well, sometimes the only thing that's holding us back from experiencing that is our own pride or insecurity. I mean, just using Peter's example, he was too insecure and prideful to even imagine how God was going to send him out. So restoration has, in, the, in that moment, had less to do with what Jesus was doing, but more to do with what Peter was going to let him do, what Peter was ready to experience. So maybe restoration is just something you need to experience right now today and just agree with God on. And just let him finish the redeeming. So, to that end, I want to give us an opportunity to pray together. So if there's anybody here who needs prayer for one of these reasons, maybe you feel convicted by the message and you just want to come up and give prayer and respond to the message. Or maybe it's something else. Maybe you've come here with a, a, another <laughs> another burden on your heart. Or um, maybe you, just, you need healing for something. Or... Um, Maybe it's unrelated to the message completely, or maybe just this message has really convicted you, then I want to invite you up to come and give prayer. Um, otherwise, you can pray in your seats, or um, we're going to continue on in the rest of the, mu the, the service with music, so you can sing along with us as we pray and worship through song.
This is our last song of the day. Just a closer walk with a classic. chances go slow and uh thank you for coming lord i pray that you'll uh be with us as we launch out from here today and uh help us to just wear your word on our heart and be transformed by it into the image of your son jesus christ amen, amen. love you guys But it feels